You're all welcome to stay, of course, uh, but it's really free form. Um, you know, our job here at Crowd Supply and what I've been doing for the last five years plus is to uh, kind of evaluate um, people's projects that they bring to us, uh, help them shape them into something that we think will work, actually launch them, and then help them deliver, right? Uh, now, we're not doing the manufacturing, uh, but we're advising pretty much on every step of the way, and then we actually do ship the boxes out. Um, so those boxes that, that you got coming in, if you're not going to use them, leave them, because we'll, we'll use them. Um, yeah, so anybody, I know there was a sign-up sheet downstairs. I don't have that with me, but uh, if anybody wants to just come up and pitch an idea, it doesn't have to be well-formed or anything. Yeah. Sweet, come on up. Okay, so this is kind of a this is kind of a meta idea. Oh yeah. There's an agreement here that everyone's gonna steal your idea. Oh, uh, absolutely steal the idea. That's a great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, like I said, this is kind of a meta idea. Um, I recently uh, had a product that I took through FCC unintentional radiator certification. Anybody done that? It's what you're supposed to do to sell stuff legally. Um, it's a lot harder than it should be and a lot more unreasonable than it should be. So I started a project called uh, ICTD, which is the uh, Internet Compliance Testing Database. And it's if you have an open source project and you get it FCC tested in an anechoic chamber, post all your results in one place and talk about lessons learned, like things that went well and things that went badly. Um, so I, I, in the last four months, I had like 10 hours in a chamber, and it's $400 an hour, and that's a lot. Um, but I put a call out, and I was like, if you have an open source project, mail it to me. If I have time, I'll pre-scan it, I'll post your results, and we can talk about it. Um, so I would encourage all of you to do that. You get it in two-hour chunks. You don't need all of it. Put a call out, get other people's projects, and test them, and post them, and we talk about it. So um, I don't have my computer up here, but I do have a link. Uh, it's bit.ly slash ICTD dash PLZ because ICTD is taken. So it's Internet Compliance Testing Database dash please PLZ because I want other people to contribute to the project. What was, uh, the what was that? Yeah, so whether or not to get your product tested is a totally different discussion. Some people do it, some people don't. But if you do, it's a pain in the ass, and we should all share our successes and failures in that regard. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it, redir it redirects to a Hackaday project site. So if you're on hackaday.io, I'll add you as a contributor, and you can put your own post up. And yes, sir? Are you local? Uh, Minneapolis. Yeah, because I'm going to put a bunch of stuff up there pretty soon, and it's going to be just absolute garbage. Uh, so I want people that actually know what they're talking about to contribute to it. And we can start building a, you know, a database, a public database of stuff that works, and then we can all do that. And then we are all compliant, and that's great. Sir? Where did you get testing? I, um, so I got, like, th what, what lab did I use? I used a company called Element Material Technologies. They're actually based out of Portland, but they have a lab in Minneapolis that I used. Um, yeah, I sent out an RFQ to like four local labs, and they were the, the cheapest. So that's what I did. But yeah, that's it. Awesome. I really like that idea. Uh, we get a lot of questions from a lot of our creators about FCC testing, and it's really expensive and annoying, and most people have no idea what they're doing. And so sharing that, that uh, knowledge would be amazing. I know that um, if you saw Andrew Greenberg's talk this morning, uh, he's involved um, at PSU, at, which, at Portland State University, and they, are, they have a pretty fancy anaconic chamber. Uh, I don't know if it's online yet, uh, but Chris Clark, who may or may not be in the room, looks like not, uh, he's the guy to talk to, and I know they're opening it up to people just for that initial test, you know, not for their actual certification, um, but that's what I hear. Anyway, great. Uh, Chris Clark at LID, uh, Laboratory for Interconnected Devices or something like that, um, at PSU, and Andrew is, is involved in, in that as well. Um, but yeah, PSU LID is what you want, L-I-D. Uh, okay. Did you want to, do you have a pitch? I guess I do. Please come on up, yeah. 
Thank you. So I kind of asked for this session, but I didn't expect an audience, so be friendly, be nice. I'm, oh, I'm on the camera. Hey, hey, camera. How are you doing, camera? Yeah, I'll, I'll, be the, I'll, I'll do my own panning, okay? Oh, hi, camera. We have to. So I've been working on this for about two years, on and off. Pretty simple idea. I don't know if it if it's worth anything, so it'd be interesting to get some feedback. I struggle getting text from my cell phone to my computer, the random computer I'm sitting in front of at any one time. I just, and what started this was I moved from Linux, I moved to Linux from Windows and Mac and my password manager, my password manager was left behind. And so my passwords are all on my tablet or my phone and I'm trying to type them into a computer in front of me. And so I came up with a thing that's pretty simple, which is a, um, I guess you'd call it a, uh, a, a Bluetooth to HID bridge. So it's a device that is a keyboard to the computer. So you plug it in, looks like a HID keyboard, and it's a Bluetooth uh, serial port back to the Android device, right? So you can then paste key codes down into the computer. So you could conceive, you could, so, uh, and I've been using it on and off for a little bit. Uh, so you could conceive, for instance, you can walk up to any random computer, pop it in, the computer sees it as a keyboard. Because Android can't do USB, sorry, it can't do Bluetooth, it can't pretend to be a Bluetooth keyboard, right? The Android device, the Linux device drivers don't let you pretend. So this thing gives you the chain, it converts a serial port to a keyboard, essentially. So it lets you punch key codes through. And so you could see, for example, an app that would take that further would be a little keyboard on your tablet, for example, that you could walk up to any random computer and plug in. And then you could start typing and it would look like a keyboard to that computer. There's no device drivers or anything to install because it's just a hid device. So anyway, that was what I, uh, and then I've kind of taken it further and I, one of those silly things where you get lost on projects and you keep doing more things and stuff. And I end up switching to ESP32 and then I started to look around and I realized that actually there's all these people doing ESP32 but no one has built a stick. So an ESP32 on a serial port in a little stick, which is what I really need, right, with a, a micro doing the USB because ESP32 doesn't, ha doesn't have... So there's a, there, there's, a, there's a meta product that you could build that this software would run on. So just to step back a little, it needs an app on the Android side because it's going to have to pick, or the OS X side, it's going to have to pick up, sorry, the iOS side, it's going to have to pick up the, the clipboard contents and uh, send it over Bluetooth to get this device to push, to, to push the characters in. Um, but then as soon as you can do that, as soon as you've got that Bluetooth, uh, sorry, as soon as you've got that USB device in front, you can do all kinds of things, like you could do MIDI, you could do all, all sorts of things. Hi, camera. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, that was my. That's essentially my idea. To take it a little further, and then okay. So why not? Why? And I've actually do, I've got some prototypes, and I've been messing around with that sort of thing, but I never sort of finish it. The thing that I, I went on a DigiKey, and I look for the USB, If you look at the microcontrollers, and you say, okay, what has got USB? And you sort by price. There's this fabulous little device that's like just around a buck, in single quantities, and it's actually an 8051 that has USB. It's, a, um, it's similar to the thing that's in the Tomu. It's, in the, it's, in the, it's an EFM 8 instead of an EFM 32. And uh, that'll do uh, all, all kinds of things you want on USB really, really cheaply. And uh, so you put that together and you put your, your ESP32 on there and you can conceive a bomb that's less than 10 bucks for, for, for uh, quite easily and then stick them together or stick them in a plastic case and off you go. That USB part took me further in another, on another tangent. Uh, actually, and it's interesting to see Tomu come out because uh, I've got some PCBs that are really similar to Tomu, but they're... But th Everyone got a Tomu in their box, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, you know what Tomu is, right? Uh, maybe you haven't done the workshop. Hey, camera. So um, with an EFM 8 on it instead, of, and, and I was, so what I was looking at was, uh, and maybe this is a really antisocial thing to do, but those... Those trick apps that uh, press the shift key when you don't know, sorry, those trick devices that press the shift key when you don't know or wiggle the mouse, that sort of thing. So you can actually, with an EFM 8, for, well, your bomb has, has a cap and, and a micro, so it's like a, 
you know, point, I would say a dollar and one cent perhaps, maybe the caps have gone up a little more, but, and uh, you can fit it inside like the Tomu, but flush, so you can't actually find the damn thing. And the idea there would be, you could sell them like, the, you could, I mean, if, if the bomb cost is that low and you can stick them on a board, you can probably sell them for four bucks each. And, so, and they'd be a, a horrible trickster thing that people could, you could sell in a bag and people could stick them in their friends' USB ports and they wouldn't be able to find them and drive them crazy. <laughs> it's pretty antisocial, so anyway, but, but the th the, anyway, the, 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 if, it's interesting to, to do something like that, go to DigiKey, Look for microcontrollers, search for USB, and you'll find that there's these really cheap parts. Now, it, people are scared by the 8051. You don't have to know any 8051 stuff. It's all in the, in the um, Silicon Labs UI. Um, so don't be scared by that bit. So man, that, was my, that was my thing. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. They're my two things, I should say. Maybe three. I don't know. But anyway, that's my pitch. Uh, I only brought what I could bring on the aeroplane as carry-on because I didn't really want to, didn't really want to have it all taken off me. But I do have some uh, various boards and things there. Um, I mean, there's a form factor. That's a form factor. Uh, I mean, this. I don't know if you know. You've got some other products that have used this same case. Again, look on DigiKey, sort by price, and you'll find there's a nice little USB case on there. That's like a dollar thirty or something like that that uh, will clip around a, a decent sized board that will fit an EFM32 and, and all that stuff in it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's actually not, that's the, that's, the phys that's, that's the biggest PCB you can fit in the case. In fact, it has to be that size because there's not much in terms of mounting. It has, to f it has to fill the entire space. And then in this bag here, I have some of the, um, some boards from our friends Oshpark that are, uh, teensy tiny little things and they're like 20 cents a, a piece to get done and, and these are um, the, and in fact the Tomu is interesting to me because these things really need a case you can kind of shove them in someone's USB port but they might short out which might be more than you want to do to someone else's USB port you might just want to press the shift key instead of cause, causing smoke so these in fact could be modified to possibly fit in a little Tomu case or part of the Tomu case maybe chop it in half and um, yeah, there's still, like I say, just a single micro on there. I didn't even bother putting a cap on there, actually, to be honest with you. I thought it was probably, because these are disposable, right? So it, it's probably going to work. So anyway, that's my, cool. thanks for your time. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Tom? I, I like this idea. It combines kind of. Uh, anything, anything that you, you just throw USB on seems to be pretty successful. Uh, we've, like you mentioned, we've had a lot of projects. Niels is sitting in the back there. Uh, he's actually implemented a similar solution um, with the Signet. Uh, he's doing a workshop on that later. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, uh, you know, we have the infinite noise. Uh, uh, TRNG, which uses that case. Um, yeah, or, or no, sorry, it uses, I think it uses a different case. So the chaos key uses that case, I, I believe. Uh, um, but yeah, there's, there's tons of the USB dongles um, ranging from full-blown Linux computers like the USB Armory to you know, things with no firmware in it like the infinite noise generator, but, uh, but making it more accessible. Yeah, I love it. I, I like it a lot. The place that I'm really stuck on, which is, I don't know if it's overkill or not, is the ability to reflash everything once you've shipped it, which is a really important thing as an end consumer because everyone wants to be able to change everything and update everything and fix bugs and stuff. But it, that can be a nightmare when you've got two micros and you've got to engineer the thing so that it'll never break. And that's kind of got, got me a bit stuck in terms of boot, order of booting and which micro can 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 we update which other micro and whether I do it over Bluetooth or over USB and all that sort of stuff. But that's a reasonably complex. That that would be a really good talk if someone could give that talk, because engineering for update a bit field updatability is a uh, is a whole you know it's almost a whole engineering subject on its own. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, and there are some people. I know the Tomu, for example, the, the enclosure on the Tomu is designed so that you can't reflash it as a security feature. So that's something else. Is like you, you don't want it necessarily reflashed. But anyway.
Yeah, because not everyone has a development environment set up. Yeah. 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 Cool. Next pitch. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Snow, and this is a microtonal musical instrument I've been working on. There's this one's kind of a, a mock-up. Um, you know, it doesn't have. A, it, there's a circuit board that I need to. I'm kind of in the process of designing. Uh, there's an earlier version of this uh, that's all done with breadboards that's set up downstairs. As far as I know, it's working. Um, hopefully, it will continue to work. Uh, so this is uh, meant to be a music, musical keyboard, four octaves. It's designed explicitly around a tuning system called Just Intonation, in which all the musical notes have frequencies that are whole number ratios with respect to each other. And the ratios are actually printed on the, on the keys. So it's, it's kind of very useful for if, if you're the kind of person that doesn't like, uh, you know, learning music theory just as like, here's a bunch of fairly arbitrary rules that somebody said sound good. If you want to like understand music from first principles and say like, oh, hey, if I play the three sounds that are in uh, four, five to six ratio to each other, that's a major chord. That's kind of an interesting thing to, to know, and you can, you can work out the math for yourself. Um, this is uh, designed for um, five and seven limit just intonation, so it, you can play ordinary standard Western music on this. You're kind of limited to one key. That's one of the limitations of just intonation is that if you want to modulate to another key, you're going to need a bunch of notes that you might or might not have on your instrument. Uh, let's see. The um, So you, you, it also plays in seven limit just intonation, so that gives you a lot of new musical notes that are kind of a little bit alien to um, contemporary music. Uh, keys are pressure sensitive. Uh, it acts as a MIDI controller. Um, and uh, let's see. So I've, I've been working on setting up a, you know, some kind of user interface. So there's a touch screen, a bunch of buttons. Um, and then in the upper left, uh, I'll just have a bunch of potentiometers that can assign to various things. Um, and so that's where I'm at. I'm trying to get to where I can build one, and then once I've got, uh, you know, one working, uh, I'll see if I can make more. I think I've got it figured out to where I can build these things without too much manual effort. I mean, probably the, the most laborious thing uh, at this point will be, like, just coloring the keys. Um, uh, any questions? Well, it will be. The, the whole, whole back of this thing is going to have one big printed circuit board that has the, the contacts for the keys. Um, I mean, I've got the... Uh, um, this is kind of another mock-up where I've, I've printed what the PCB traces uh, I mean, mean to look like once this thing is an actual PCB. Um, there's this kind of like interdigitized fingers thing that you can do. Um, and then layer a pressure-resistive film over the top. The shape of the keys have meaning, or they just uh, Sort of. The, the, I mean, the, the shape of the keys doesn't mean anything in itself, but they kind of arise out of where the keys are, the centers of the keys are positioned. And I have an algorithm for that. It's, uh, um, it kind of looks a little bit more disorganized than it really is. There, there is, there is a... a pattern to it. So if you, if you say play a, you know, a major chord in a particular voicing, it has a certain shape, and you can move that shape anywhere on the keyboard. Um, it's an isomorphic uh, layout. So the, that's a really nice property to have, and it makes it a little bit more intuitive. Uh, yeah? Um, so the previous version um, just runs off of a Raspberry Pi. Um, this one, I'm intending to use a Teensy. 
because. Um, yeah, not yet, but that that is that is um, an option. One of one of the things I've thought about is, is uh, you know, I'd, I'd like it to work as a MIDI controller first. That just that's probably what most people would want to use it for. But um, with the Teensy Audio, you, I can have it be its own synthesizer and just plug in headphones, which is kind of nice. And uh, you know, the other option is to um, leave some space on the printed circuit board to solder in a, a DAC um, to uh, do CV output. So I can plug it into modular setup or something. Uh, yeah. You, you mentioned it's limited to, to one key. So can you change the root note? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that can that can be a configuration option or you know, if if you if you're really clever, you can set up like hot keys or something. Like this this thing has a bunch of keys on the bottom, the black ones that are meant to be just assignable to anything you want, and I figure you know, I can use those for like, you know, pitch bend and modulation and stuff, but I can also, and maybe octave up and down shifting, but you could also have like, you know, hit this button and suddenly you're in the key of D flat or something. So, yeah. Wait, does that mean it can't do chords? Oh, you can do chords. I mean, it's, it's great for chords, actually. It's, it's a polyphonic instrument. Oh. Yeah, like a stenotype machine. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually looked at those. I, I, I thought that there, there actually were some projects to make good, cheap, cheaper steno keyboards. Yeah. I'm, Yeah, I hadn't, hadn't really thought of that as like a different market. Yeah? Uh, we, not to like bring it back too many times to the TC audio stuff, but if you're just getting, it's great, but if you're just getting started with it, uh, Paul did a workshop like three years ago now, um, and as a part of that workshop, he did like an hour long video and has like a 30 page manual that is really good. So if you're okay. Yeah, I've, I think I've I think I've seen that on his site. He's got a link to the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've been meaning to watch it. Haven't gotten that far. The, the, the manual especially is really a great reference. Yeah, yeah. My my actual uh, current place I'm kind of stuck at is just like PCB layout, and you know I've I've got a I think the schematic is pretty much done, but. I have to do some weird things like, okay, I've got, I've got these traces that are program, programmatically laid out as an SVG file, and I need to import that into KiCad somehow. And I, yeah, the weird shaped PCBs one. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. The only thing I would say is that having just gone through a process with someone with an oddly shy circuit board, that would be an expensive circuit board to make. So just What's that? that would be, I, I, I would suggest that that would be a fairly expensive circuit board. Yeah. So yeah, I figured I probably wouldn't go with Osh Park because it's per square inch, but, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the other the other problem is that I, I probably want it gold plated because of the I don't want the the contacts to oxidize. So so yeah, Goshpark does that. But if I want a real cheap circuit board somewhere, then it's the gold plating. Okay, okay, okay. 
Um, I, well, I did that with the first one, but I kind of came to the conclusion that it's really nice to just deal with one big circuit board and not have to deal with like connectors. Um, I mean, maybe there's an easy way to do that, but. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Any anyone any any uh, any more pitches? So we're at lunch, so this isn't going to be long. Um, Carl, do you know that my hobby is stenography keyboards? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my personal project that I've been working on for years now is to make a new, cheaper stenography keyboard. And uh, the first step of that was making a key switch. So I got a mechanical key switch made by Matthias, uh, which is one of the mechanical keyboard switch makers in Canada. Um, specifically for this keyboard, it's the lightest uh, touch, quietest switch in the world, as far as I know, or for mechanical keyboards in the world. Um, uh, and I'm hoping that now that Teardown is, only has one more day, uh, I can return to the project and actually make a, it, we're, we're trying to target a $300 price point, uh, but it should be able to replace completely a professional keyboard in a stand-up type machine, which is 5,000 bucks. A thousand dollars is cheap. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, well, so stenography is weird because um, it, it, if you compare it to a guitar playing, um, I could, as a completely uh, uh, untalented musician, go to a thrift store and buy a guitar for 10 bucks and then teach myself uh, how to play the guitar to like a reasonably low level and be happy with that. Um, uh, or I could go to conservatory and become a world class. Uh, concert guitarist, right? Um, in Steno, there's only that world-class concert guitarist level, right? You 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 either you either are a stenographer or you're not, and there's no there's no amateur level. Um, so the project that, that I helped start with a stenographer a friend, I'm not a stenographer, uh, but the, the stenographer a friend of mine who started the project and I kind of glommed onto it, uh, called the Open Steno Project. Uh, we started with just a piece of software that replaced a several thousand dollar proprietary piece of software, some open source software, and then people started using that, and now they're using it professionally. Um, then somebody wrote a book, uh, so you don't have to go to school anymore necessarily to become a professional stenographer, which that alone is two years. Uh, it costs about $20,000 a year or more, and um, has a, get this, 90% attrition rate. So. Only 10% of people who go to school for photography make it, and the others just spent thousands and thousands of dollars on, on software and hardware and schooling for nothing. Uh, and they don't use it again because they can't because it only works with their proprietary software and hardware. So we're trying to change that. I'm not going to hold you up for lunch anymore, but uh, check out opensteno.org. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's two, there's kind of two types of professional stenographers. There are what's called CART, uh, capturing and real time, which is for people who, um, in 80, any, any American college uh, or, or university or educational institution has to be ADA compliant, American Disabilities Act. Um, and so if there is somebody who is hard of hearing, for example, in a classroom, then they have to have some sort of capturing and real time system. That could be a lot of things, but one of the things it could be is a professional stenographer who sits in the back and just in real time types everything out and the, the person has a screen they read it on, right? So that's one thing. Another is the, the legal profession or depositions or medical records. Um, but the cool thing about this Open Center project is that people are starting to use it for things that like I would use it for, like coding, right? Or just writing a book. Or instead of you know, replacing their keyboard with a steno keyboard. And instead of topping out at like 120 words a minute, which is really fast on a QWERTY keyboard, uh, you could top out at 250 or 300 words a minute in stenography, which is faster than we speak at, right? What are the pros? Yeah, so the, yeah, to be a professional, you have to get to 255 words a minute, I think. That's, that's the, the lower 
that's, that's, that is literally what it means to be a professional. If you pass this test with a certain accuracy, then you're, you get certified. Yeah, so the, the world record is 360. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's sustained, you know, Mark Killingsworth, or uh, I think that's his name. No, not Killingsworth. Uh, kills, I'm forgetting his name now. Sorry, Mark. Um, super fast guy. He has his own steno theory. It's super interesting. It, it's a weird, I went to the National Stenography Association, uh, uh, or National Court Reporters um, Association meeting once. It's amazing. You should all go, because it, it's just the weirdest thing uh, I've ever seen. Um, super nice people, but it's a very weird world, yeah. Uh, it's a common uh, question. You should read Mirabai's blog post on that. Basically, answer is no because you don't always want to be talking, right? I, like uh, there are many, many instances. Most of the time, when you're at a computer typing, you don't want to be talking. And so, if you're using it for day-to-day -day use, um, uh, there are a lot of instances where where that wouldn't work. Or if you're on a subway, or or I mean, there's a lot, a lot of even if voice recognition is perfect, which it's not, then there there are always cases where you don't want to do that. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, <laughs> it'd be through the roof. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's basically a macro machine, right? So you just type a few keys, and it, the dictionary tells you what that maps to. So it could be, you know, a Java class boilerplate, or it could be uh, the in, you know, Declaration of Independence. No, yeah. Uh, well, this is, uh, steno machines are over 100 years old. This is uh, from a long time ago. You know, we're running out of time, so uh, let's go eat lunch. Yeah, sorry, Mira. Oh, yeah, 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 one, one more thing, sorry. Hey, hey, everybody, just before you run real quick, I work with Josh, not directly at CrowdSupply, but I, we work together. I run a consulting business. If you have a hardware project that you want to go to market with, you are ready to show it to the world, either by crowdfunding it or whatever, and you need somebody who knows what they're doing about going to market, helping you with PR, media, uh, I'm the person to come talk to. So come see me at the end. I've got business cards, and uh, we've worked together on a couple projects now. So that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>